seated and welcome to our Wednesday evening service here at Cornerstone Independent Baptist Church. It is a joy to see you for this midweek service. Thank you so much for being with us. We're looking forward to the time that we have to gather together and worship our Savior tonight and to exalt His name. And I am so thankful that you have chosen to be with us tonight. If you're visiting with us, we want to extend to you a very special welcome. Thank you for joining us. If you could do us the favor of reaching to the back of the pew in front of you and grabbing one of the Connect cards that you'll see there. And if you would take just a moment and fill that out, and then you can just give it to me at the end of this service and give me the opportunity to thank you personally for being with us. We would appreciate that so much. We're going to go ahead and begin our service at this time with prayer, so let's bow our heads and our hearts to the Lord as we pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this opportunity that we have to gather in your name and worship you. And I pray tonight that as we do so, that you would help each one of us to come with hearts that are, that are open to you, that are sincere before you. Lord, I pray that you would do a work in our hearts as only you can. Please speak to each person. May we be drawn closer to you because of our time together in, in this place. And we'll praise and thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's take our hymnals out once again, please. Hymn number 358. 358. Yesterday, today, forever. We're going to actually start on the chorus. Then we'll do the first verse, and then we will finish up with the chorus once again. Let's sing it out. Hymn number 358. Yesterday, today, forever, Jesus is the same. All may change, but Jesus never glory to his name. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. All may change, but Jesus to come forward at this time and as we're preparing to receive our offering at this midweek service we are continuing our regular procedure of collecting for someone else on Wednesday nights this begins a new month and so we have a new project this month our others offering will be going toward our missionaries the Pierce serving the Lord in the nation of Haiti Several months ago, in one of their update letters, they mentioned a very special need that they had of getting some supplies and shipping them to another location where there are people there who are ministering for the Lord and trying to do a work, but in great need of supplies. And as you can imagine, shipping internationally is so often very expensive, and it was a need beyond their ability to meet on their own. And so we decided that we would help them beyond our typical support for them by taking an offering throughout this month uh, to help them with that special project. So over the course of the next few weeks, we'll be taking our midweek offerings for the Pierce, their ministry, in this special need uh, of shipping some needed supplies for their ministry. I'm going to ask Brother John Workman if you would pray over our offering.
praise you for that. If you would, take your Bibles and let's find our place in God's Word at 2 Corinthians chapter 5 this evening. 2 Corinthians chapter number 5. Thank you so much for being in the Lord's house on this Wednesday night. It does my heart good to look out and see a good congregation of people on a Wednesday evening. May the Lord bless you for His faithfulness. We had announced on Sunday that we were going to be having a missionary from Direct Line Ministries with us tonight, but uh, that was not able to happen tonight. I had been in communication with them and hadn't heard back and called their office today. They're based in Ohio, talked to the director, and some things had come up. So we have rescheduled him to be with us uh, later on this month. And he was very apologetic of the situation. I told him, well, the Lord just knew that it wasn't the right time. So we'll have you later this month and just trust that that's the right time for us to have you. So I guess that means you get to hear me again tonight. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I want us to find our way to verses 14 and 15 in this text. Notice, if you would, what Paul writes. For the love of Christ constraineth us. Because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Would you read those words again with me? Such powerful words that Paul writes here. Again, he says, For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge, that if one died for all, then we're all dead. And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. I'd like to preach a simple message tonight entitled, Selfless for the Savior. Would you bow with me as we pray and ask God's help? Lord, I pray tonight as I come to you that you would open the Scriptures to our eyes and to our hearts. The Holy Spirit of God would do His work through the Word of God to convict, to challenge, to exhort, to encourage. And I pray you'd empower me as I preach your Word because I cannot do so without it. We'll give you praise and honor for what will be accomplished in this service tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. It has been written at the close of life. The question will not be, how much have you gotten, but how much have you given? Not how much have you won, but how much have you done? Not how much have you saved, but how much have you sacrificed. Not how much were you honored, but how much you have loved and served. Here in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, is Paul, of course, is writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God in verses 1 through 10. He describes his hope and assurance that he has an eternal home in heaven with the Lord. And I don't know about you, but I am thankful tonight that I have God's word, that when this life on earth is done, I have an eternal home in a place called heaven. It's not because of any good thing that I've done or any good that I am in and of myself. It's only because of what he has done. And Paul would say the same thing. He said the same thing over and over again in his writings. Nothing that we have done gives us salvation. It's all because of Him. It's all because of His sacrifice that we have that assurance and hope of a place with Him in heaven. But then in verses 11 through 21 of this chapter, Paul describes his ministry for the Lord in his life. He speaks to us about his hope and his assurance of his eternal home. But now he turns his attention to what he is doing in his life in service to the Lord. And as he discusses this, I believe he makes a mention of the most important decision in life 
outside of the decision for salvation. There's no question that the decision that you make for or against Jesus Christ is the most important decision you'll make in this life. What you do with Christ cannot be compared to any other decision in life. And if you've made the decision to trust Christ as your Savior, you with Paul have that hope and assurance of heaven with the Lord for all of eternity. But outside of that decision for Christ or against Christ, Paul speaks about the greatest decision in our life, and I believe he speaks of it here in verse number 15, where again we read these words, and that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. It was during my personal time with the Lord many months ago that I read through this passage. And in the margin of my Bible, I simply wrote this question. Will I live selfishly for myself or selflessly for my Savior? Think about that tonight. I believe that outside of a decision for or against Christ, this is the greatest decision of life. This decision will affect every other decision you make. If you make the decision to live selfishly for yourself, that motivation will impact every other choice that you make. If you choose to live selfishly for your Savior, that choice will affect every other decision that you make. This, I truly believe, for the believer, is the greatest decision of our lives. So for a few moments tonight, I want us to consider two aspects about this decision that are found right here in our text. Number one, would you see with me the motivation? See the motivation. You know, don't you, that every decision that you make has a motivation that is driving the decision. What you choose to eat, what you choose to wear, the vocation the job that you may have, the car that you drive, the restaurants that you frequent, the stores that you go to. All of these decisions that we make on a daily basis have a motivation that drive that decision. And as Paul writes here about his labor for the Lord, he shares with us two of his motivations that drove him in his decision and his labor for the Lord. Notice the first motivation in verse number 10. It is the judgment seat of Christ. He says in verse 10, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. As Paul writes to the Corinthian believers in By extension and application to us, he says, there are motivations that drive my decision. I have decided in my life to give myself to the Lord, that my labor in this life is going to be for Christ. And here is a motivation that is driving that decision. I understand and I believe that at some point, at some day, I am going to stand before Jesus Christ, that place he calls the judgment seat of Christ. He wrote about it also in Romans chapter 14, verses 10 through 12, where he said this, But why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Let's answer a couple of questions about the judgment seat of Christ. Number one, who is the judgment for? Who is the judgment seat of Christ for? Notice in verse number 10 of 2 Corinthians chapter 5, he says, We must all appear, that everyone may receive the things done in his body. In Romans chapter 14, which I just quoted, he said, So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Understand that in both of these passages, 
Paul is writing to believers. The context is believers. So when he says everyone, when he says we all in these passages, he is speaking about believers. He's simply helping us to understand this. Every single believer will stand at the judgment seat of Christ. You say, well, aren't the unsaved going to be judged by God? Yes, they will. They will be judged at the great white throne judgment spoken of in Revelation chapter 20. The judgment seat of Christ is for believers. No one is accepted. Every one of us. In Romans chapter 14 and verse number 12 again, he said, So then every one of us shall give account of himself. I think so often as we think about the judgment seat of Christ and giving an account to God, we may picture just standing as a large group of people as God just passes judgment all over a a whole group of people, as it were. But that is not what the Bible presents. Each one of us will personally, individually stand before God to account for our lives. What is the judgment for? Notice two things in the text. Number one, it's for the revelation of character. He says, we must all appear. The word appear here doesn't mean simply that we'll show up. If I said to you that that someone suddenly appeared in my home, the thought that you would take from that is someone showed up. If I told you or whatever that... Uh, that the president showed up, he appeared at my home. You would take that to mean simply that he showed up. But that's not what the word means here. The word means to be made manifest or to show oneself. In other words, it's more than just that we're going to show up. It is that our character will be manifested before the eyes of him who sees all. He sees all things. He knows all things. One wrote it this way, not only standing there arraigned before him, but as being read through and through by him, and then being in his judgment exhibited in our true character, whether as better or worse than man thought us to be. You see, it doesn't matter who or what we are in the eyes of others. It really only matters who and what we are in the eyes of God. And he sees and knows all things. The judgment is for the revelation of character. Secondly, the judgment is for the rewards of character. He writes here that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. And Paul is simply helping us to understand that we will be judged justly, receiving exactly what it is meant for us to receive. When we stand before Christ and give account of our lives and give account of ourselves and our works, 1 Corinthians chapter 3 speaks of it as our works passing through the fire of His judgment. He knows and He sees all and will receive reward in accordance with the lives that we have lived as His children. Who is the judge? Well, it's clear. It's the judgment seat of Christ. John chapter 5, Jesus made it clear, The Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son. Jesus Christ himself is the judge in this text. For Paul, I believe this was a positive thought. You see, Paul did not have to dread standing at the judgment seat of Christ. Paul could look forward to standing there. Why? Because he lived his life for Christ. He did the work of Christ. He gave himself completely to Christ. He wrote in Philippians chapter 3, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Later on, he would tell Timothy, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. He could look forward to the judgment seat of Christ because he knew he had sincerely given himself completely to Christ. But how about us today? For some of us, the truth of the matter is that we avoid thinking about the judgment seat of Christ. 
Or if we do, we may think of it negatively because we know in reality we have not given ourselves to Him, for Him, to His Word, and for His will. There's a second motivation in the text. Not only does Paul speak of the judgment seat of Christ, but he also speaks in verses 14 and 15 about the love of Christ. Notice again, verse 14. For the love of Christ constraineth us. Paul says here that the love of Christ is a constraining love. The word simply means to urge or to impale. It it compels us, it urges us to make a specific response. Paul speaks here about the demonstration of his love. He says, he died. I don't know about you, my friend, but I can't think of any greater demonstration of love than someone laying down his life for me. Can you? There's no greater way that someone could show you sacrificial, unconditional love than to lay down His life for you. And Paul says here, as I think about the love of Christ that constrains me, I recognize He died for me. He he gave the greatest demonstration of love that He could possibly give. I know that Christ loves me beyond measure. I know that Christ loves me beyond all others. I know that Christ loves me completely, unconditionally. How? Because He died for me. He speaks of the depth of His love. He died for all. In Ephesians chapter 3, Paul wrote about how he prayed for the Ephesian believers and one of the things that he prayed is that they would be able to comprehend the length and the height and the depth of the love of Christ. That they would be able to understand how much Jesus loved them. Why? Because Paul understood that if we get a grasp on, if we can begin to understand and comprehend how much Christ loves us, what a motivation that would be for us to give our lives completely to Him. As we look at this passage and understand this decision that Paul sets before us, we need to see the motivation. The motivation is the judgment seat of Christ. We're all going to stand before Him someday. The love of Christ. I want us to hold our place here in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 for just a five for just moment. Go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. I hadn't intended to turn to this passage, but I think we should see it. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, another passage where again Paul speaks of the judgment seat of Christ. In verse number 11, he says this, For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. Notice verse 15. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Here's the truth. A motivation, thinking about the judgment seat of Christ, Thinking about the love of Christ. I don't know about you, but when I stand before Jesus Christ, and my works pass through the fire of His judgment, they're going to come out one of two ways. It's either going to be gold, silver, and precious stones, or it's going to be wood, hay, and stubble. And when I stand before Him, I want my works, I want my life to have counted for Christ. I want it to be gold, silver, and precious stones. I don't want it to be wood, hay, and stubble. And he says here, if it's gold, silver, precious stones, he'll receive a reward. 
But then in verse number 15, he says, If any man's work be burned, wood, hay, and stubble, he goes on to say, verse 15, He shall suffer loss. Now please understand, it's not loss of salvation. Only the saved appear at the judgment seat of Christ. We are eternally secure in Him. That's why Paul goes on to say, But he himself shall be saved. My friend, if someone tries to tell you that you can lose your salvation, that's false teaching. That's not what the Bible teaches. He himself shall be saved. It goes on to say, yet so as by fire. You say, Pastor, what exactly does that mean? I'll be honest with you, I don't know exactly what it means. Literally, it has the idea as one who has passed through the fire. I can't help but wonder if the indication is, as John would write in Revelation chapter 1, that Jesus' eyes are like a flaming furnace. If as someone who who has stood before Christ, who had trusted Him as Savior, who knew what Jesus had done for them, who knew how much Jesus had given to them, and yet they did not give themselves completely to Him, They did not live their lives for Him. They did not live selflessly for their Savior. If standing before Him and having His eyes fall on them. Oh my, what what shame. What regret. What grief of heart standing in the presence of the One who gave Himself for us. Who, by the way, is still marked by the torture of the cross, recognizing I've not given my life to Him and for Him. See the motivation, the judgment seat of Christ, the love of Christ. Would you go with me back to 2 Corinthians chapter number 5? And I want to secondly to see the demonstration or the determination. Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, as he considers that Christ died for all, he says that, it's a purpose statement, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Paul presents two possibilities, the selfish life and the selfless. These are two possibilities for every believer. It is a sad truth, but it is true nonetheless that someone who Jesus has given His life for, has shed His blood for, that they can come to Christ for salvation and then still live a selfish life. Still live for themselves. Still live for the pleasures that this world can afford still not give themselves completely to Christ. And should you think that that only applies to people who are out there in the world and and just terrible wickedness as we might see it, please recognize that we could be right here in the church on a Wednesday night and not have completely given ourselves to the Lord. Not be completely selfless for Him. One Bible commentator gave five descriptions of the selfish life. He said, first of all, when people seek pleasure, gain, or reputation is the controlling principle of their lives. They live for themselves. When they are regardless of the rights of others and sacrifice all the claims which others have on them in order to secure the advancement of their own purposes and ends, their intentions are for themselves. When they are regardless of the needs of others and turn a deaf ear to all the appeals which charity makes to them, have no time to give to serve them, no money to spare to alleviate their needs, and especially when they turn a deaf ear to the appeals which are made for the diffusion of the gospel to the benighted and perishing. He he says this, when we see a need and have the ability to meet the need, but don't meet the need, we're living for ourselves. And he's not just talking about temporal things, he's talking about spiritual things. My friend, understand, when we see a world that is lost, dying on its way to hell, and we do nothing to get the gospel out, we do nothing to share Jesus Christ with a lost and dying world, we are living for ourselves and not for Him. When 
and their main purpose is the aggrandizement of their own families, for their families are but a diffusion of self. And then finally he said, when they seek their own salvation only from selfish motives and not from a desire to honor God. Multitudes are selfish even in their religion, and the main purpose which they have in view is to promote their own objects and not to honor and not the honor of the master whom they profess to serve. In other words, you're a Christian because of what you get out of it. Proverbs 28, verse 27, He that giveth unto the poor shall not lack, but he that hideth his eyes shall have many a curse. 1 John 3, verses 16 through 18, Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us, and we are also to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoso hath this world's good, and seeth his brother have need, and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? John says, you see a need, you have the means to meet the need, and you do nothing about it. John asks the question, how can you say that God's love dwells in you? My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. The selfless life is spoken of in different ways all through the scripture. I see the selfless life as I hear John the Baptist say in John chapter 3 and verse 30, He must increase, but I must decrease. I see the selfless life as it was said of Paul and Silas in Acts 15, 26, that they were men that have hazarded their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. In 1 Corinthians 10, 24, we have a command, Let no man seek his own but every man another's wealth. In Philippians 2, 3, and 4, another command, let nothing be done through strife or in vain glory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Galatians 6, verse 2, bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. My friend, That is what it is to live the selfless life. That is what it is to live a life that is lived for your Savior rather than yourself. We each need to take stock and examine ourselves to test. Am I living selfishly for myself? Or is my life truly a life that is selfless for my Savior? What does the selfless life look like? Well, selfless life is a life that is completely surrendered to Him. A selfless life is a life that sacrifices to Him. A selfless life is a life that serves Him. Is that true of your life? Is it true of mine? Selfless for the Savior. Let me ask, which life are you living? Is it a selfish life? Or is it a selfless life? One writer wrote these words, The life of an intelligent being must be under the way of some chosen and cherished motive. What is the chosen and cherished motive of your life? Is it you? Or is it him? He went on to say the entire aspect and character of man's life may be changed by a change in his motives. I would submit to you that if your life is selfish, if your life is about you, if your life is not all about him, That's exactly what you need, is a change of focus. goes on and says, No man ever did rise to do noble things while his motives concerned only self and self-interest. All noble lives have been spent in service to others. All the best lives in private spheres have been self-denying lives. All the heroic lives in public spheres have been the lives of patriots, the lives of the generous, the pitying, and the helpful. My friend, those types 
types of things ought to be the things that are characteristic of our lives. How about it tonight? Is your life a selfish life? Or is it a selfless life? Would you bow your heads and close your eyes with me, no one looking around, and for just a few moments... I want us each to examine our lives. In just a moment, we're going to have a brief time of invitation. And I'm just going to simply ask if God is speaking to your heart, maybe tonight, overall, in general, you recognize that your life is a selfish life. Or maybe as you think about your life and the different compartments of your life, you realize that there may be a particular area in which you've been living selfishly. I'm going to ask you, if God is dealing with your heart in just a moment, that we would come to Him and we'd confess it to Him and we'd make a commitment to Him that we're going to live selflessly for Him rather than selfishly for ourselves. Heavenly Father, as we have just a brief time of invitation, God, I pray the Holy Spirit would do His work in our hearts. Help us to respond to You as You would have us to. We'll be sure to give You the praise and thanks for it in Jesus' name. Would You stand to Your feet with Your heads bowed and eyes closed? The pianist is playing. We're not going to tarry long, but if God is dealing with your heart, I'm going to ask you to respond to the Lord. Would You come and find a place at this altar and Just confess that selfishness to Him. Would you tell Him, make a commitment to Him, Lord, I've been selfish in my life. I've been selfish in this area, that area. God, I'm coming to you tonight to commit to you. I'm not going to be selfish. I'm going to give my life completely to you. Be selfless for you. God is speaking to your heart. Won't you come? Let's find a place and do business with Him tonight. Heavenly Father, we praise you again for the opportunity to be in your house. Lord, thank you for your word, for the encouragement, the instruction that it gives, the challenge that it gives. And I pray that each one of us would truly put ourselves to the test and look at our actions, look at our words, what we do, what we think, and be sure that we are living selflessly for you and not selfishly for ourselves. Lord, please help us to be right in this area of our lives. Such an important area. We'll be sure to give you the praise and honor for it. Be in the rest of our service now as we spend time sharing the needs of our hearts and praying for one another. In Jesus' name, amen. Brother Ronnie Peacock is going to make his way. You can be seated to uh, the podium at this time. He's going to give us some mission highlights and then lead in our prayer time tonight. So if you'll go ahead and take out your prayer sheets, and we'll get to those here at this time. A few missions updates, first of all. Of course, we have the Balsamo family in Connecticut. Going to enter from our presence. And they had a few reports that uh, they had a youth group come up from Trigger Street Lakeshore a few weeks ago. Of course, they only got kicked out of places twice. Thank you. 
you so much again for being here for our midweek service. Let's make sure that we take these prayer sheets and these thoughts of the things we've heard tonight and be praying for one another. God's a God who answers prayer. We've seen evidences of that right here in our congregation. What a blessing to have Keith with us here tonight after just having surgery on Sunday. And he's back with us. God answers prayer, friends. And we need to be praying for one another in these needs. Uh, each of us have needs. Some mentioned, some not. Let's be praying for one another that God would, would help us, would grow us, would work through us to reach our neighbors and our community to the Lord Jesus Christ. just want to remind you that over the next uh, week and a half, so or yet, we'll be collecting college supplies for our students who will be continuing or starting college in the next several weeks. So I want to encourage you, if you've not already done so, to check out the list on the bulletin board here that names each of the students where they'll be attending, as well as some suggested supplies. And the boxes where you can drop those things are out here on the left side as you leave the, the back lobby here. And let's be praying for our college students as well as they get started, that God will give them a good, smooth start. God bless you. Have a wonderful week.